never any single, or very rarely is there any single clear answer in economics, which was actually why I found it so, um, uh, so enjoyable to do economics. Because um, at school, we were always taught that there was one right answer. Uh, even in subjects such as history, there was the, the correct answer, and then everything else was incorrect. And when one came up to uh, university to do economics, one soon discovered that actually there wasn't a single answer. And I found that um, uh, that it, it was it, it, enormously sort of relieving. I, it, it was like being um, freed from shackles so that one could think for oneself rather than try and memorize what one was told was the correct answer. I started as a historian. When I specialized at school, I specialized in history. Um, and again, I think that economics is a, a splendid subject, not only because there isn't one correct answer to all, most of the questions that we get asked, but also because I think it's a very good mixture uh, of history, uh, of knowing what has happened in the past and how we got where we are at the moment, and a much more rigorous mathematical analysis. And I think that the combination of history and mathematics uh, is, a, is a very good, very valid one. Um, and in a sense puts us apart in a way from some of the other social sciences. Now having said that, um, and I think that the subject from time to time varies too much in one direction. Uh, I, I, I have been doing monetary analysis and with particular reference to central banking. And for a time I, in the 1960s, I was at LSE with Richard Sayers. And I think that uh, the Sayers School uh, that he established at LSE was much too historical, with too little sort of attempt to frame it within the analysis, within the mathematical rigorous framework. But equivalently, I think that in uh, recent years, uh, it's been, un uh, been very upsetting for me uh, that history has been downgraded, and indeed that economic history is no longer, not only not required as part of the uh, undergraduate economics uh, sy uh, syllabus, uh, but um, I also that I mean, the whole sort of thrust of the sub of the subject has gone far too mathematical, with little and too far too little reference and under appreciation uh, of historical evolution. As a sort of monetary economist, I've done I've been doing a lot on sort of regulation and supervision. And one of the things that, uh, in a sense, most upsets me about uh, a lot of current economic theorizing and analysis is that it assumes that the legal and institutional structure is given and static, uh, so that the only thing that happens is you get various shocks to the economy, and it all remains the same. And, and particularly if you look at what has been happening since the great financial crisis in 2008, that's not the way it works, and the way it works is you get a shock. That has certain effects obviously some of which in many cases are adverse. And one of the results of that is you get a change in the institutional structure, for example, in the financial regulatory system. That in turn feeds back into the way that agents behave. Um, so you get sort of a development, uh, which again, result, uh, at various times you will get a, a new shock coming. So you get a, con a sort of continuous or evolutionary, and what we don't have at the moment uh, in economics is, is an evolutionary equilibrium in which the, the, the institutional uh, and regulatory structure is changing along with the, with, the, with, with the economy and with the severity of economic shocks. If you take a particular point of time and you assume that everything in the way of the underlying structure of the economy is going to be constant, then it is almost always possible to divine, 
or set out a, a set of rules which will be optimal, uh, partly because of the time inconsistency problem, uh, that within a, a, a given structure they will do better than, than discretion. But if you assume that the underlying structure is going to change, and change in ways that you simply don't, can't appreciate, then almost any rule that you initially set out uh, will turn out to be mistaken, fallible, uh, far less than optimal, um, because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how the structure is going to change. You don't know how agents are going to behave. Uh, the world changes, and if the world changes, uh, you need a, a sufficient flexibility to, to change the way that you operate within that. I'd say you can't, that no one has that degree of uh, insight about the future, and the future is unpredictable, and we just don't know. I mean, this is Keynesian uncertainty, and again, the, and I think one of the uh, the key issues uh, between um, those who describe themselves as post-Keynesians and those who describe themselves as neoclassical, neo-Keynesians, whatever, is that the latter group seem to believe that uh, you know enough about the probability distribution to be able to come to some reasonably accurate judgment. Well, the Keynesians argue that there is, or the post-Keynesians argue, that there is so much uncertainty around that you actually can't do that, that most, thing, most decisions involve a leap of faith, um, which they do, because we, we, we can't predict. Um, and again, that's another feature that I feel very strongly about uh, with respect to the use of economists um, in the modern world which is, overall, economists are primarily used for forecasting. And that's what we actually cannot do. Uh, we can't do it. And um, I know forecasts are, are horribly fallible. And I think that it would be much better uh, if we were used to express what are the risks, what are the potential dangers that we see, uh, rather than try to do um, uh, a forecasting, uh, which we really don't have the capability of doing. I mean, you know, yes, we can forecast six months ahead to a degree, because there's a great deal of momentum within the economy. Uh, if you don't have something like Brexit bringing about a sudden major change, I mean, normally there's a great deal of momentum. But by the time you're coming sort of two years down the road, um, you, you, you really don't know very much. Um, and, and here I would very strongly sort of recommend um, uh, Mervyn King's recent book with his, the emphasis uh, on uncertainty uh, rather than the risk embodied in a probability distribution. You know, to take one particular topical example, um, uh, we've had the, the, the decision uh, to leave the EU and Brexit. That has, brings about a huge degree of uncertainty. We don't know what the effect of that uncertainty is going to be over the next quarter, let alone sort of in 2017. I mean, there's a very wide range of potential outcomes. I mean, even for, the, for, for this quarter, I mean, uh, that I, one of the complaints that I have about the use of, of economists um, uh, is the, the way that they're used to try and provide forecasts, which really not possible. And, the, uh, and to give a kind of analogy, it's as if you were trying to do a weather forecast where your own forecast will influence the weather. You know, the weather's, I'm mean, forecasting the weather is difficult enough beyond about five days away. But I mean, the forecast that we make of the weather doesn't influence the weather itself. But in economics, the forecasts that we make influence how people behave and how they respond. And that just makes it you know, an, an, another degree of difficulty. I and mean, if meteoro meteorology is difficult enough in forecasting,
I mean, economics is just a sort of quantum level more, com more difficult. As I said earlier, I think that uh, there should be much more history. Uh, if there had been uh, more greater reliance on history, uh, I think there would have been uh, an appreciation uh, that, or greater appreciation, that a combination of a housing boom and credit expansion was highly dangerous. Um, and what happened to a degree uh, was that um, the, in the US there were wonderful data uh, on housing, all aspects of uh, the housing market, and which went back to the early 1950s. And for 50 years you had monthly data um, on housing prices and all that. And during these 50 years, if you held a diversified portfolio of houses across all the states in the US, there was only, I think, one or two quarters where housing prices overall, on average, fell. I mean, there were, there were crises in New England at one stage and in the oil-producing states at another. But if you diversified, um, you seem to be safe. If you took these 50 years and ignored history elsewhere um, and you ran your sort of econometric analysis and assumed that the future was going to be like the past of those 50 years, it actually came about that you reckoned that a decline in housing prices over the whole of the United States of more than about 4 or 5 percent was an almost unimaginable event. And it was basically on that premise that people went into, uh, for example, all the subprime stuff. Because it didn't matter if you were lending to poor people who were people who were likely to get ill, who were in the fringes of the labor market and so on. Because if they couldn't repay you for one reason or another, if housing prices didn't go down, you could foreclose and you would still be safe because you wouldn't lose any money. Um, because you could sell, um, and the whole of the sort of the subprime and the rest of it, which initially was done for the uh, best of intentions, um, and it was to try and get the disadvantaged of America into the housing market. Um, and if you could rely on ever rising housing prices, it would have worked. But you couldn't, and history would have shown you that. So I would certainly I would want to start by reinstating history to a far greater extent into the, into the syllabus. Um, and the history not only of one country, because again, any country is, has a sort of particularity. I would want to have a history of, of uh, two or three countries. And apart from that, um, I, I would want, I would hope there would be very much more uh, humility. Uh, and uh, to some extent, also an appreciation um, that many of the mathematical models which are constructed, and many of them are constructed with a sophistication and a technical brilliance, which is uh, in many ways remarkable and very good, but they depend on their assumptions. And the assumptions of these models uh, are frequently uh, so extreme um, and that particularly relates to uh, what are known as the micro-founded DSGE models. I mean, to take one example, prior to the 2008 great financial crisis, the assumption in these models was that you could assume that everyone was the same, a representative agent, because no one ever defaulted. But if no one ever defaulted, um, either for strategic reasons or accidentally, then you never needed a bank because everyone could borrow or lend at the riskless rate. And you didn't need money uh, because if nobody ever defaults, then your individual IOU is entirely acceptable for any purchase of anything anywhere. So you don't need money. So and the, whole, the whole sort of basis of the construction of a financial monetary system depends ultimately um, on, on default. And it's, um, 
I know, as my friend Dmitry Somakos mentioned, um, uh, you need default in order to construct a financial system, just as you need the devil and sin in order to construct a religious system. And you, it doesn't work unless things can go desperately wrong. In both cases, I mean, both for religion and for economics and finance. Um, and by having excluded what can go wrong within the financial system, they didn't have as a result of financial system. And to some large extent, they still don't. Um, and that's one of the, what I mean by saying that the so-called micro-foundations are not proper foundations at all. They, don't, they simply don't reflect um, the reality of life. Um, but trying to do so, trying to get a model that reflects all the com complications of life is such, particularly when we get the evolution that I was talking about in the underlying legal and institutional structure, is so complex that we're re a really a very, very long way from doing it. But as long as we're such a long way from constructing a model that approximates to reality, at all, we have to be much more humble uh, about what we can learn from these models.